Amen. So the last four, three weeks, this is the last week, we've been in a series dealing with uh, marriage. And the title of the message series is For Better or For Worse. And I'm just stealing that from the traditional uh, marriage vows that we get in front of a, a minister or a justice of the peace, however you got married. But most of the time you say something along the lines of for better or for worse, richer or poorer, sickness, health, till death do us part. And I love that line for better or for worse because I know that if you're married long enough, there's going to be better days and there's going to be worse days. You can't avoid worse days. You can't. They're part of marriage. Some of my married people, I know you don't want to like agree too hard because you don't want church people judging you, but you know it's the truth. You know it's the truth. There's hard days in marriage. And so what I want to do as a pastor of this church, we believe in family and we want to be a family. And the only way we can be the healthiest church family we can be is if our individual families are operating the way that they should be. And I think that starts with healthy marriages. So week number one, the title of that message was Kill the Myth. And the idea is that you think, there's, we wouldn't say this because you know the Sunday school answer. You know what you're supposed to say. Who meets your deepest needs? Jesus, right? You, you know you're supposed to say that, right? But how many of us in practice, we know it in theory, but in practice, how many of us, when we look at our life, there's this constant sense of dissatisfaction and things aren't right at home and you're blaming everything on your spouse and the reason you're doing that is because Jesus isn't meeting your deepest needs and you're looking to your spouse to meet your deepest needs. And so now you're constantly frustrated with them because your foundation isn't where it should be. So that's week number one. You gotta kill the myth that your spouse can meet your deepest needs. The second thing we looked at was cultivating friendship. Just because we say I do doesn't mean we stop being friends. I, I know that's just like, duh, James. But I feel like there's a lot of people, they just completely take their friendship for granted once they get married and they stop working on it. They stop spending time together. They stop doing the things that brought them together to the point where they wanted to become married. And, and so why would we stop doing those things? If there was this friendship intact before we got married, why would we stop doing those things together? So we need to develop a friendship, be invested in friendship. And then last week we talked about communication. The title of that message was, He Said, She Said. And we talked about how differently men and women communicate. We communicate differently. We have different goals in why we communicate. And this, this is just true. And what I want to say, I, I think the most important thing I said on Sunday was to apply James 1.19 to your marriage. I'm not big on guarantees, but if I were to give one guarantee on what could make communication in your marriage better overnight, I would say two people practicing James 1.19, your, your communication will get better overnight. Because if you're slow to speak, quick to listen, and slow to get angry, you'll, you'll start communicating. Instead of being quick to speak and slow to listen and quick to become angry, you, you'll start communicating. You'll get on the right page. You'll get on the same page together. So I think that was the most important thing we looked at in communication last week. And let me tell you something. Today, I've saved the toughest me uh, marriage message for last. I thought if I preached this at the front end, nobody would come back. So, <laughs> no, I'm joking. I know you guys like to be challenged. I'm always surprised that it's like the hardest messages that people come and go, man, thanks, James, for saying that. So this is going to be tough. This is going to be a hard message. Uh, just buckle up. We'll get through it together. But it's an important message. And the title of my message this morning is Covenant or Contract. Covenant or Contract. When it comes to marriage, how do you view your marriage? Are you in covenant with your spouse or do you just have a contract that you've worked out? You do these things and I'll be happy. You do those things and I'll be happy and we'll just live in the same house together and get certain things done. Sounds like a contract to me, not a covenant. And there's a big difference between a contract and a covenant. And I want to explain that to us today and it's, it's going to be convicting. Like I was preparing this message and I was just like, man, James... You sure you can preach this? Like, look in the mirror, bro. Like, this is tough stuff, but we need it. We need it. So here's, here's how deep the contractual view of marriage runs in our world today, okay? And I think the idea of contract and contractual everything is so embedded in our society that we don't even recognize that in many ways it's crept in to how we view our marriage and how we view our relationship. 
Did you know in 2011, this is for real, this is a true story, I'm not just making this up, I don't make up stories, uh, but anyway, this is a true story though. When I first heard it, uh, I had to Google it to make sure, and I found multiple resources that backed it up. Did you know in 2011, Mexico was playing with the idea of a two-year marriage license that expired after two years, you had to renew your marriage license because they have so many divorces right now? And so they thought, okay, here's what we'll do. It, the first time you get married, you're just going to try this marriage thing out. You'll be married for two years. If you don't renew your marriage license, then it's not a divorce. There's no harm done, no foul. Just go your separate ways. If you want to renew your license, then renew it and you can be married longer. 2011. That, that's how deeply we view contract in marriage. There's another lady, she's a marriage and family counselor, and I wouldn't pay her a nickel to counsel me. But anyway, she wrote a book uh, called The New I Do. I can't remember her name. But in The New I Do, she says we need to have wed leases. You know, you just sign up for two, four, or six years to get things started. Because, you know, we have, we have a learner's permit for people that drive, so why not have a little permit time for people to get married? So, you know, just for two, four, or six years, you know, you try this marriage thing on. If it doesn't work, don't renew the lease. Can you believe that? That's for real. This is a supposed expert in marriage proposing that we, ha we take on this kind of view of marriage. And do you realize that if we're not careful as the church, if we don't understand the difference between a contract and a covenant, we'll buy into that kind of stupid thinking. It will creep into the way we view marriage. And here's the thing, God is not a God of contract, He's a God of covenant. And when God views marriage, He views it as a covenant. I want you to look at a scripture this morning from Mark chapter 10, verses 6 through 9. Here's what God says about marriage. He doesn't say, you guys, you know, just try it out for two, four, six years. Here's what God says about marriage, okay? It says this, Mark chapter 10, verse 6, God made them male and female from the beginning of creation. And this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. They're no longer two, but one. Let no one split apart what God has joined together. So it's not a justice of the peace or a minister or two people saying vows that brings people together. It's actually God bringing people together. He makes two people one through the covenant of marriage. Yes. Do we have a contractual view of marriage or do we have a covenantal view of marriage? Because there's a big difference. Pastor Chris Hodges uh, from Highlands Church in Birmingham, Alabama defined this so brilliantly that I had to completely steal it. I'm not stealing his whole sermon. I'm just stealing how he defines these two things because it's, it's that good. I had to share this with you. And this is in your notes this morning. Here's the difference between a contract and a covenant, okay? In a contract, in a contract we protect our rights and we limit our responsibilities, in a contract, we protect our rights. We make sure that everything's going to turn out the way that we want things to turn out. And then we limit our responsibilities. So we don't want to have to put too much into this deal. Make sure we can get all that we can get without having to pay too much in. That's how we want to operate on a contract, isn't it? If you go in and you're wanting to buy a new car and you're going to go into a contract with a, a, a dealership or a bank to get finance for a car, what do you want to do? You want to protect your rights and limit your responsibilities. I guarantee you, if you're a smart person, that's what you want to do. You want to see how far you can get that interest rate down. You want to see how low you can get the payments. You want to protect yourself in a contract. A covenant, however, is completely different from a contract. In a covenant, this is so good, in a covenant we, pick, we give up our rights and we pick up our responsibilities. So in a contract we protect our rights and limit our responsibilities. In a covenant we give up our rights and we pick up our responsibilities. Do you understand what that means? It means that selfish people don't do covenant. That's what that means. Self-centered people don't do covenant well. Because in a covenant, you give up your rights. In a covenant, it's not about you. In a covenant, you're saying, I'm laying down my life so that I can make sure you uh, flourish and, and grow into all that God has for you to be. 
And I'm willing to lay down my rights and pick up extra responsibilities in order for you to become all that God's created you to be. Do you understand what happens when you have two people doing that in a marriage? It's really beautiful. It becomes a picture of the gospel to the world. It becomes a picture of Jesus laying down his life for the church and the church submitting to Jesus' leadership. And people see God at work through marriages that are covenantal, not contractual. Let me just prove to you that God views marriage as a covenant, okay? In Proverbs 2, verse 17, uh, in Proverbs chapter 2, Solomon starts to discuss the uh, adulterous woman. And there's a difference between uh, a faithful wife and an adulterous woman. And here's what, how God uh, says that a woman is, why a woman is guilty before God when she's adulterous. And it's this, she's abandoned the covenant she made before God. So what is marriage? It's not a contract you make before men. It's a covenant you make before God. That's how God defines marriage. The men of Israel came under judgment in Malachi 2 verse 14 for dealing treacherously with their wives by covenant. How does God view marriage? He views it as a covenant. So let's talk about this idea of covenant in the scriptures. Used to be church people had a pretty good idea of what a, what a covenant was. Um, this might be the very first time I've really spoken in depth on what covenant is on a Sunday morning, and I'm kind of ashamed. As I started thinking about this, I kind of got ashamed to think that I haven't explained covenant more to you. Because this is worth us knowing and understanding. Um, so covenant, what is a covenant? In the Old Testament, the word covenant is the Hebrew word berith, and it means to cut. When you entered into a covenant, it, you cut covenant. Colton, can you be my good-looking assistant lady. He's, he's single. He has a job. He has his own business. And he loves Jesus. Triple threat. I'm just saying. Just saying. I'm sorry for that. I don't know where it came from. But it is all true. Okay? So when you would cut covenant, you'd, you'd have uh, Colton's leading a tribe, I'm leading a tribe, a family, a patriarch of different tribes would come together and either they had been fussing with each other and they're like, this has to come to an end, or they have an enemy coming and they realize we have to become allies. So what they would do is they'd take a knife, they'd cut their hands, okay, I cut my hand, Colton, you cut your hand, okay? And cut the other hand. <laughs> okay? Cut that hand, all right? So your, your hands are bleeding. You're cutting a covenant with each other, okay? And there's blood coming out. Remember, this is pre-modern. We don't understand there's blood-borne diseases. I realize this is nasty, okay? I get it. But you would take your hand that you had just cut, and you take it, and you, I mean, you rub it in together. There's this intermixing of blood. You've just now cut covenant. And in doing this, what you're saying is, your enemy's my enemy. My enemy's your enemy. Your friend's my friend. My friend's your friend. My family's your family. Your family's my family. Whoever you fight, I fight. Vice versa. We're in covenant with each other. Colton, you're so great. Thank you so much. Ladies, his number is... No, I'm kidding. Um, but this is the first part of the covenant, okay? And then to show that you are ratifying the covenant, there's this next step that you took. It involved usually a bull, but some sort of cattle animal. And you would take that animal and you would cut that animal right in half. It's gross. Cut the animal in half, then you spread out the two pieces of the carcass, and then the two patriarchs of the family would walk between those two pieces of carcass. And do you know what that meant? It meant if I break this covenant, let what's happened to this bull happen to me. When you entered into covenant, it was serious business. If I break this covenant, I deserve to die a gruesome and horrible death. That's how you entered into covenant. That's how you cut covenant. That's what berith meant in the Old Testament. You guys are starting to get why this message is challenging now, aren't you? Because in a covenant, there's not an opt-out clause. In a covenant, death's the only way it's broken. And what we learn about God is that God is a covenant-keeping God. And that God keeps covenant with humanity at great price to himself. 
And we as Christian people, we're supposed to reflect God, right? He's our standard. So if God's a God of covenant, He's not a God of contract, then our marriages should be founded on the idea of covenant and not the idea of contract. A amen? 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 amen. <laughs> Let's make it even harder. Let's make this even tougher, okay? Who's read the book of Hosea lately? Anybody read Hosea lately? There's a reason why you probably don't read Hosea. I'm just telling you. Because when I read Hosea, there's something in my flesh that pushes back. There's something in me that goes... God, how could you make that man do that? How? But that's just me. I know all of you guys just read the Bible and you don't ever argue with it. That's fine. I'm glad for you. But there's some things I read in the Bible and fleshly speaking, uh, I have to by faith accept it and believe that God is teaching me something greater even when I can't quite wrap my mind around it. And Hosea is one of those things that it's kind of hard for me to wrap my mind around what God called Hosea to do. If you don't know who Hosea is, he's a prophet in the Old Testament. He's a man of God. He hears the voice of God, and then he goes and proclaims the message of God to the people of God. That's, that's what Hosea does. So Hosea is a faithful man of God. He's a man that follows the covenants of God. He's a man that follows the word of God. He lives a righteous, pure, upright, holy life. This is the kind of man Hosea is. One day the word of the Lord comes to Hosea and God says to Hosea, Hey, Hosea, I want you to go to the brothel and find a woman named Gomer and I want you to marry her. Do you know what a woman in a brothel does for a living? She's a prostitute. That's, that's what Gomer is. And God tells Hosea, go marry this prostitute. I want you to marry her. I want you to become her husband. I want you to have children with her. I want you to make a home with her. I want you to enter into covenant with Gomer. Now, this isn't in the Bible, but I would imagine, I would imagine because if it were me and I heard that from the Lord, I would say, hold up. <laughs> I don't think that's God. That's definitely me. I just made that one up. <laughs> you know, like God would have to tell me a couple times to go marry the prostitute named Gomer. But, uh, Hosea does what the Lord tells him to do. He goes and he marries Gomer, brings, him into, brings her into his house, marries her, becomes her husband, enters into covenant with her. They have children. One day, one day, Hosea wakes up and probably his worst nightmares come true. Hosea is nowhere to be found. And, and you know what his first thought probably is? His first thought's probably the worst thought that he could have and it was true. She's gone back. She's gone back to the brothel. She's left me. Eventually, word gets back to Hosea. Somebody comes to Hosea. And, and now, don't ask me how I know this, Hosea, but uh, Gomer is back in the brothel. And then the word of the Lord comes to Hosea again. And you know what God has the audacity to do? <laughs> he has the audacity to say, Hosea, go to the brothel again. Go get your wife. Go buy her back from the pimp that she sold herself to again and take her back into your home. Because you've, you've made a covenant with her and I want you to go get your wife back. I, I told you guys, this is why I didn't preach this message, verse one, because this is tough stuff. But this is how God views covenant. So Hosea obeys, and he gets his wife back, brings her back into his home. Do you, you know what this teaches us? This is hard. I understand this is hard. And I understand, biblically, there is an opt-out clause for unfaithfulness. I get that. And I'm not saying that, that people are unjustified in taking it, okay? Because I've never been there, so I can't judge or throw stones at all. But I'm telling you, this is how God views covenant. And so for me, I push back against this story because uh, thinking about it in my perspective, in my place as a man, that God would say, I want you to take her back, that's, oh no. I'd have a hard time doing it. But when I step back and I stop thinking in the flesh and I understand this, that God's showing me something about His nature. Yes. See, this was more about God than it was about Hosea. 
You see, God is a God of covenant, and the people of Israel had played the part of Gomer over and over and over again. They would cry out to him when they needed something. He would deliver them. They would be faithful for a little bit, and then it would be back to serving and worshiping other gods, spiritual adultery after spiritual adultery. And time and time again, God humiliates himself and takes his bride back. Because he's a God of covenant. Do you understand how deeply that means God loves us? The, 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 his love for us isn't based on our performance. His love for us is based on who we are and His covenant that He's made to us. And so this is the God of covenant. And this is what God's asking us to build our marriages on is on a foundation of, of covenant. And there's no opt-out clauses in covenants. So what do we need to do? What do we need to do? I think a lot of us, if we are 100% honest, we'd realize that there's some areas where we've let the contractual view of marriage creep in and that we've allowed the world to become our standard instead of God setting the standard because God's standard's so high. So I believe the first thing we've got to do is we've got to say, God, search my heart. Is there any areas in me where I'm viewing marriage as, as a contract? Because if I am, I've got to get rid of that. I want to be the kind of person that I take this covenantal view where I will actually give up my rights and pick up my responsibilities. I don't want to have the contractual view where I'm protecting my rights and not doing anything and limiting my responsibilities. I think this is what we have to do. We have to repent. We have to have a change of heart, a change of mind. That word repentance means that we change direction. Romans 12 verse 2 says, Don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So the first thing I want us to do is just, God, do I have a contractual view of marriage? Because if I do, help me. Forgive me. Help me have a covenant view of marriage. And then the second thing, and this is just, I, I can't go four weeks talking on marriage and not talk about sex. I know we get uncomfortable when we say the word sex in church, but it is in the Bible, and God created it. And He actually, when He created everything, He said it's all good. You know, when God told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply, them having children wasn't going to happen magically. You realize the same biological stuff that it takes to reproduce children was true in the garden as it is today. So God made sex, and sex is a good thing. So let's just throw that out there. First thing, we as Christians have to view sex through the lens of covenant, though. That's in your notes. Christians view sex through covenant. Sex itself is not sinful. I think that's where the church has gone wrong so many times. Is we're just up here, sex is bad. Bad, 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 bad. No. Sex is good. God created it. Sex itself is not sinful. Sex outside of covenant is sinful. Remember... Man, i got to hurry. In the Old Testament and the New Testament, there's this ceremony attached to covenant, okay? In the Old Testament, it was the cutting of the bull. Do you realize in the New Testament, God cut covenant with us through His Son, Jesus Christ? <laughs> 39 lashes on His back. He was cut wide open that we could enter into covenant with God. So there is a ceremony attached to covenant that finalizes a covenant, that ratifies a covenant. Uh, the Bible says that Jesus ratified a new covenant with his blood. And so sex, when we understand it through covenant, sex becomes, um, it beco we used to say sex was the consummation of marriage. That word consummate means to finalize or complete. So sex was meant to be this thing after two people had entered into a covenant and laid a foundation that we're going to go through life for better or for worse. We're going to limit our rights and we're going to pick up our responsibilities together. We're going to give our lives to one another. As a husband, I'm going to lay down my life for my bride. And brides, as, uh, as a bride, I'm going to submit to my husband as the church submits to the church. That's Ephesians chapter 5, by the way. It's two people that made up their minds to do this. And then the ceremony that shows that you've entered into covenant with one another was meant to be sex. It's meant to be the final thing that completes the covenant. And I don't think we understand that. 
And I think we don't understand it because we have a contractual viewpoint of everything, so we have a buy now, pay, lay, pay later mindset on everything, including sex. Like, we'll, we'll start having sex now and we'll work out all the covenant details later, and that's getting the cart before the horse. God wants us to know that we're in covenant first, then sex comes after. It's a consummation, a finalization, a ratifying of the covenant. When we have a con contractual view of sex, we'll have this buy now, pay later view of it. And another thing that we'll do is we'll use sex to manipulate. We'll use sex to reward or punish. And that is absolutely unbiblical. You realize in the book of Corinthians, the Bible says that the two have become one to such a degree that the wife's body no longer belongs to herself and the husband's body no longer belongs to himself. So what does this mean? You belong together and you don't use sex as a tool to manipulate one another. That's what it means. Amen. I know nobody wants to say amen right there. I guess that'd be a weird spot. <laughs> yeah, James, but... <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, <clears throat> that's what a contractual view does. It allows us to have this buy now, pay later mindset, and it allows us to use sex as a weapon against our partner, which is wrong. It's evil. But when sex is attached to covenant, let me tell you what happens. Number one, sex is holy when it's attached to covenant. Hebrews 13 verse 4 says the marriage bed is undefiled. Yeah, that's in your Bible. I know it's not like a memory verse from Sunday school, but that's in your Bible. It's in there, okay? It's in there. Second thing it does, it establishes and generates a deeper sense of oneness with your spouse. And the third thing it does is it guards you from sexual temptation, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 5. The Bible actually says that we shouldn't abstain from sex when we're married except for seasons of prayer and fasting because... The enemy knows that we're sexual beings and so he tempts us with sex. And so God says, no, 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 don't separate from one another for any reason but for prayer and fasting. You guys look uncomfortable this morning. I just said sex more in the last 10 minutes than I have in eight years. But it's the truth. And we've got to view sex through covenant. Because so many of us, that, that, I think that's why sex has gotten so messed up in the world is because the church doesn't understand covenant and how we're supposed to operate within covenant with one another. So, um, what do we need to do? If our marriages are going to last for better or for worse till death do us part, how are we going to do this? Because here's what I know. I've never done a marriage and had this conversation you know, before the ceremony. I was reading some stats, and I'm not going to break down all the stats because they're mind-numbing and they're painful to rehearse. But the average marriage that ends in divorce, it usually takes eight or ten years. That's when marriages usually break apart. So I've never had a conversation with a bride or groom on the day of their wedding that goes along these lines. You know, in eight or 10 years, I hope that I'm going through the agony of divorce. I hope that we're having to figure out how to split up assets, and I hope we can go to family court and decide, you know, how to do visitation, and all this stuff. Nobody, never had that conversation on wedding day, never, right? So if we're gonna avoid the pain of divorce, if we're gonna avoid the agony of going through that trauma, because it is a trauma, it's, it's deeply painful, it, it hurts people, it, it, I mean, it's, it's a wound. A lot of people carry the rest of their lives. I'm not saying Jesus can't heal it, he absolutely can, but it's a big wound, it's a hard one. So how are we gonna avoid that? How are we gonna make sure that eight to 10 years down the road after we've said I do, we're not dividing up assets and figuring out a rotation for our kids? How are we gonna do that? tell you how. Build your marriage on covenant. And I realize it takes two people to do that. I realize that. But if two people will build their marriage on covenant, they'll, ne they'll never have to discuss what to do with the house, what to do with the kids. They'll never have to do that. 
because they're in covenant with one another. They've cut covenant with one another. And when they said, till death do us part, when they said for better or for worse, they weren't just saying it to their spouse, they were saying it to God. Amen? I think that's the only way in the world we live in for our marriages to survive is that we say, I'm in covenant with you. And there's nothing that's going to break that covenant outside of me taking my dying breath. That's it. Let me pray for you this morning.